Thanks very much, Mark. It, it's a great pleasure to be here again at the Outlook Conference um, talking about CFI. Um, this is actually the third year in a row I've been uh, part of the discussion on the CFI, so it, it, it's good to reflect, I think, a little bit on how far we've come, and that will certainly be part of the presentation I'm, I'm going to give you today. Um, and I'd particularly like to acknowledge um, Halal's presentation and the work of ABES. I think it's it's extremely good to have this economic rigour around some of the, uh, the forecasts as, as to what we might expect from carbon farming. So, just a quick outline of what I'm hoping to cover this morning. Um, we're going to have a little bit of a recap as to where we've got to with carbon farming uh, and, and, and also the progress on the scheme. I'd like to talk a little bit about opportunities from the CFI and finally, talk a little bit about the methodological challenges that we're facing in terms of developing the methodologies themselves and talk a bit about how we're planning to address some of those challenges. So, so just for people that, that perhaps are a little hazy on, on the detail, uh, the CFI is, of course, a voluntary offset scheme. Landholders and others can receive carbon credits for reducing emissions, increasing carbon stores through biosequestration. And as Halal pointed out, uh, the projects and the resulting credits fall into two broad categories. Uh, the Kyoto eligible credits can be used to meet carbon price obligations for, for liable parties, and the non-Kyoto credits can be sold in, into the voluntary market. And, and in fact, people like Qantas are, are quite interested in using them for their carbon neutrality measures. So, so I think one of the first points that, that's quite good to, to bear in mind is that we, we really are seeing carbon farming as, as an alternative source of, of farm income, a, a, as a source for economic diversification, if you like. I'm, I'm not sure that many people think that there's likely to be a wide-scale shift from, from, from what you're doing at the moment on your farm to, to moving into, into just a sort of a carbon farming type, type endeavour. We, we've always seen it as, as very much uh, a, a bit of both. And as I say, this idea of, of diversification and an extra income stream on farm. So, so the first question is, well, you know, how much, how much abatement, how much emissions can we look to realise fr from this measure? Um, th this is actually a fairly broad brush, high level look. It, it's really just showing you the, 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 the sort of overall contribution of the land sector towards Australia's, uh, we call it the national count, so the, the emissions across the entire economy. So, so as you can see, the land sector makes up nearly 20% of, of the emissions across the whole economy. That's probably quite important because unless you have some policy measures that can realise and, and, and capture th those emissions, take, take some action to reduce them, you're looking at a, a big part of the climate change story that, that won't necessarily be addressed. And, and the idea from carbon farming from, from the very beginning was that we saw it as a really valuable testing ground or laboratory whereby farmers and others could start to take action on the land to reduce emissions, get comfortable with the measurement approaches, and, and I guess demonstrate that despite some of the complexities of this sector, it, it is actually possible to take action in a way that, that reduces emissions and, and delivers you other benefits as well. And I'll talk a bit about the other benefits as we go along. So what have we achieved so far? Um, I, I guess I'd like at this point to acknowledge the Clean Energy Regulator, who also looks after the carbon farming initiative, because a lot of the achievement I'm, I'm alluding to in the slide is actually uh, the, the result of the very hard work of the regulator, and, and Mary Ann Wilson is sitting in front of me. So, so look, the first thing to say is that we actually now have 46, uh, 46 projects, I think it is, approved uh, through the CFI. Uh, so, so, so that's exciting, it, it, it's happening, it's a reality. Um, to support those projects, we have now 11 methodologies that have been made and turned into legislative instruments and, and are available for use. 
So, so they cover a raft of, of possible projects, including uh, environmental plantings, tree establishment, uh, reducing emissions from savanna fires, uh, re re reducing emissions by, by capturing emissions from, from livestock. We actually have approaches for, for both piggeries, and two, two approaches for piggeries and, and one for, for dairy now. Um, we also, of course, have, have methodologies for reducing emissions from landfill. Um, the, the other side of the story that I wanted to just mention briefly um, is, of course, that when the government put together the Clean Energy Future Plan, uh, th there are a number of measures that were intended to support the carbon farming offset scheme, and, and Halal mentioned a few of those in his presentation. So particularly programs like Action on the Ground, wh which was really uh, intended to give farmers some, some support for, for taking some of the technologies and practices and, 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 and introducing them on farm a, a, as projects. And in addition, the, the, very, um, the very significant contribution to the research effort, the program known as, as Filling the Research Gap. So, so it, it's, been, it's been very good to see uh, those programs moving forward uh, and, and, and the research money and, and the um, action on the ground funding starting to, to go where, where it can do uh, a, a lot of benefit. So, so, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide because um, I know we have our final presentation that, that we will look, be looking particularly at, at, at the piggeries issue. But I did think it's worth highlighting that, that further to the theme of this is happening, it's real, we now have 300,000 carbon credits that are resulting from projects that are actually available for trading uh, and, and, and available to people in, in their registry accounts. So, so that's a fairly uh, exciting and significant development, I think. The, the other thing I, I just wanted to touch on in this slide is, is this notion of, of co-benefits. And, and I think the example here about improving productivity starts to, to, to illustrate how that can work. So, so we have environmental plantings, tree establishment on, on a property at Bullock, Bullock Hills. Uh, the, the idea there is in addition to generating carbon credits from the trees, that action will, will be helping to reduce soil erosion uh, and, and deal with dryland salinity. Um, and the trees themselves will, will be creating biodiversi biodiversity benefits and also providing shelter for livestock. So it's very much this idea of win-win. Of you, can, you can have your carbon credits, but, but you can also get some other benefits along the way. So, so just to, to talk a little bit about some of the abatement that we're expecting to get through carbon farming. And, and I won't spend a lot of time on this because I think Halal's already, already covered it. Um, the slide in front of you has some estimates of, of where we think we'll be in terms of the abatement um, in, in 2015 and 2020. Some, some of these figures, are the, uh, their genesis is, is the Treasury modelling report that, that was released uh, in 2010, I think it was, or might have been 2011. Uh, my department has also done some, some estimation uh, around the non-Kyoto activities. Um, the, the abatement from those is, is, is actually been estimated as, as fairly modest. Um, so, so things like soil, um, we're, we're sort of expecting an uptake of, of perhaps only 0.3 uh, to 0.5 of a megaton in 2050. Uh, that said, and it really does go to um, Halal's points about the, the carbon price and, and the marginal abatement cost. We're, we're having another look at some of that work at the moment to, I guess, really see uh, what might happen if, if, if some of these activities are, are drawn into the Kyoto accounting framework, which, which of course is, is something that, that the government will be considering in, in, in the next little while. Uh, in that regard, j just for people that haven't perhaps heard, um, there's been some very significant progress in the international negotiations around the approaches to, to deal with uh, the, the currently non-Kyoto activities. Um, in the past, the government has been very cautious about uh, actually drawing those into the national accounts, mainly because of a concern that people might wind up with net emissions at the end of a, of a target commitment period, really as a result of things like bushfires, drought, uh, other natural phenomenon. 
Um, but there's been some very good progress in the negotiations on, on some new accounting approaches that effectively allow you to, to either look through some of those natural variability effects or, or, or with respect to something like forest, uh, the, the, the forestry uh, activities to actually set a, 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 an accounting approach that, that allows you to screen out again a lot of the emissions from something like bushfires. So that's been a very exciting development in, in the international negotiations. So then I just wanted to come to, to some of the, the, the points again that, that Halal w was working through in, in his presentation. And I suppose one of the things I've, I have observed about the way markets respond to, to market mechanisms is that it can actually be a little bit counterintuitive. Um, and, and I'm fond of recalling the experience with sulphur trading many years ago in, in the US. Um, that, that the projections of, of prices for abatement uh, were, were actually pretty high when the scheme was put in place and in fact I think turned out to be uh, about a third, lo uh, two thirds lower than, than people had projected w when, when the scheme was set up because of course you know, the market responds and, and innovates in a way that's sometimes quite hard to predict. So, so what does this all mean for carbon farming? Um, I, I think we'd absolutely take the point that we, we have a very high opportunity cost on, on land, um, that then people will be very cautious about uptaking certain activities. And the example I think that's sometimes used is as well, you know, what does that mean for, for widespread tree establishment? What does that mean for things like, um, you know, st stopping land clearing and, and letting the, the, the trees grow back? And, and I think the opportunity cost point there gets to be quite pertinent because, of course, we have the 100-year the permanence requirement uh, in, in the CFI. Uh, that said, though, uh, I, I do think that um, mixed-use options on farm whereby people uh, look, look to plant uh, strips of environmental plantings, um, th the way that can sometimes work is that you can still run, run your stock through that land once the trees have, let, have reached a certain level of maturity. Um, you, you get your stream of carbon credits. Uh, you, you can also get the sort of co-benefits that, that I was talking about earlier in terms of um, biodiversity, salinity, um, you know, wind breaks or, or, or shelter for stock, that kind of thing. So I think we do have a bit of evidence, and I can see Chris Mitchell in the audience, um, that, that, that some of those approaches can actually be very, uh, very, very rewarding and, and, and very beneficial, even, even with the opportunity cost of, 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 of something like the permanence obligation. So, so that, that's one point. The, the other thing that, that I would say is that, that there's quite a bit of, of analysis and, and research to show that you can get some very big benefits by you know, learning by doing approaches. And one of the things that's been quite exciting for my department is the very strong partnership effort uh, that we've been, been engaged in with, with industry, uh, with other stakeholders, and of course our colleagues in, in the agriculture department and, and indeed ABARES. And I think those partnerships can actually be quite powerful uh, and, and can be a way of, 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 a, of dealing with some of these issues uh, that, that can make, can make um, the, the opportunity and transaction cost a, a bit higher. So, so the, the, the really sort of pressing example there is that the potential for aggravation, aggravation, aggregation. Um, the, some of it's pretty aggravating too, of course. Um, so, so, so the issue there is that, that while you might not get a terribly high return at the level of an individual farm, if you have a project that actually cuts across, you know, a, a high number of farms ac across a whole region, then you can start to get some economies of scale with tr things like the, the, the transaction costs. It, it can start to become a lot more viable for people to, to, to participate in. So, so look, I, I guess my own view at this point is a little bit hard to tell. Forecasts are, are, are very informative. Certainly, we'd freely acknowledge that there are some, op there are some, some barriers to, to uptake of carbon farming. 
but also possibly some, some, some currently un, uh, uh, unrealised opportunities and, and, and innovative approaches that the market might respond to. So, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the conceptual challenges we've been facing on the methodolo methodology development front. Um, because I think it's fair to acknowledge that, that so, some of these things are, aren't always easy to, to resolve. The, the, one of the first things we came up against was for, for proponents that are wanting to do environmental plantings or, or, or other methodologies and projects that revolve around tree establishment, we basically uh, made available a, a very simple option uh, that, that's using a government developed modeling tool uh, known as the remote modeling tool. Um, it, it's probably very much a Fisher Price uh, go at, at, at getting carbon credits for, from tree establishment. And, and a number of the stakeholders said, well, you know, that's fine. That'll be great for the mums and dads. Actually, though, we'd like to do something that, that's perhaps a bit more ramified. Um, a, a bit more precise that doesn't rely on an, an average modelling approach. Uh, and, and the benefit of that, of course, is that, that it has the potential for, for, for generating more, more credits. And, and those sorts of approaches tend to require some, some fairly precise and rigorous sampling of, 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 of the trees that, that are involved in the project. So, so we, we've actually completed and done sampling guidance for, for um, a, a number of environmental plantings that, that's sort of there and being used, but we still need to do it for soil carbon and, and, and rangeland, the, the sort of biosequestration you, you can get um, in, in across the rangelands part of the country. So, so the work's going on on that at the moment. Um, CSIRO are, are working very hard with us on the soil one, uh, and, and, and we've started working on the rangelands one as well, but n not, not there yet. And another issue that we've been wrestling with a little bit is not so much on the measurement or technical side, it's, it's more about how you can actually conceptualise th these, these sorts of projects and how you can make them work within some of the requirements of the CFI. So as a number of you are probably aware, we do have these additionality requirements of the CFI and, and, a, and a significant element of that turns around what's known as common practice. And, and the thought there is, well, if everyone's already doing something, uh, it, it's probably not something that, that's really just happening as a result of the CFI and hence it's not really something you can use to, to offset emissions uh, generated by, by other players in the economy you're just not really getting a, an environmental gain. So, so one of the challenges that we have is, is that actually using, reducing fertiliser, um, efficiently managing your, your grazing herds, there's actually already some pretty significant drivers to, to make sure that people are being as efficient as they can. So, so that means a lot of the management actions that in theory you might want to use uh, as, as a CFI methodology for a project are already pretty widespread. So, so that, that's something that, that we're looking quite hard at at the moment too. Um, it, it's possible that what we might want to look at doing there is, 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 is a more granular approach that really does reflect differences across, across regions and, and within sectors. And, and our common practice approach does allow for that level of granularity. Uh, but we're still working on how, how to make that work in practice. Um, and another key issue is that, that some activities that, that actually do deliver abatement really aren't going to be terribly economically viable. And, 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 and that's, I think, where we get to the point that Halal's making, that in, in those circumstances you, you probably won't get a lot of uptake because even with the benefit of the carbon price, it, it may not be worth doing. Uh, and, and then the final uh, issue that we've been dealing with is, um, is attribution. So, so this, this becomes uh, quite pressing for, for soil carbon or fertiliser. And that's the point that uh, when, when you're trying to build soil carbon, actually there are a number of things that are going on. Uh, and and, and the, the resulting carbon might be the result of, of some, some natural factors like, like you know, what's the, what's the 
topography of, of the land like? Um, you know, what's the rainfall like? How can you tease out what's the result of, of a particular action and, and what, what would have happened just because of what's going on on site anyway? The, the other point I did want to mention, though, was, was sort of picking up on one of Halal's points, which is really about um, wh what, what you do to avoid, I guess, a kind of a rebound effect b because something turns out to be more economically viable a as, as a result of a project. So, for example, we're working at the moment on a methodology for uh, feed additives for dairy, so looking at fats and oils. Um, and, and the research suggests that you probably will get some productivity benefits from, from feeding these sorts of additives. So then won't it just mean that everyone will go and increase, increase the size of their herds to, to, to reap the productivity benefit? And, and that's actually quite a significant problem. Um, how we would deal with that is actually in the design of the methodology. So, so, so we would need some sort of safeguard or requirement in the methodology that, that really does get people to look at, at the size of their herds and, and, and the circumstances under which they've increased them. So challenging, but, but probably not completely intractable. So, so how are we looking to solve some of these problems? Well, the, the basic answer is, again, we're looking at a very strong partnership approach across government uh, and, and with industry and other stakeholders. So we've established technical working groups on, on all the issues that, that you see in front of, front of you. And, and I have to say, I think the experience has been very powerful. Um, just being able to bring lots of people with a, a very strong interest and expertise together to, to really try and work on, on, on some of these problems, uh, I think is proving to be very successful. So, so I also just wanted to give people a bit of a sense of, of where we're anticipating that, that certain things will, will reach a landing. Um, as I said, on the feed supplementation for dairy, um, that, that I think is, is, is reasonably close. We've actually um, put it out for public consultation, the, the mandatory 40 days public consultation for the CFI. Uh, we, we've got some, some further alternative waste treatment um, methodologies that, that are in a, in a similar circumstance. We're hoping to uh, put, put out a methodology, uh, well, put it to the Domestic Offsets Integrity Committee and, and then an out for public consultation in the middle of the year on improved fertiliser management. Um, this has been a very interesting one because we started off thinking that we could do something that would have broad application that proved to be a little more ambitious than, than was doable. So, so the current thinking on fertiliser is that it will be reasonably constrained. It, it will really just be for the cotton industry in the, in the first instance. But again, lessons learned from, from working through those problems will, will help us in the future as we move on to a, a broader application. Um, we are working on biochar. Uh, there, there, there was, there, there's been a technical working group set up um, and, and I think a very useful workshop earlier in the year, sort of hoping to, to have something done there um, mid-2013. And, and then the, the, the one that everyone's very keen to see is, is soil. Um, that, that one, I think, is on a slightly longer time frame, so, so probably 2014. Uh, we're, we're hoping to have something to, to put out for consultation. So, so those were the, the main points I wanted to cover. If, if anyone uh, would like to follow up on any of these things, um, th there's some contact details on the final slide.